Welcome to OpenS TV. Today I'm with Lukas Tobeki. Lukas is the founder of LRT Capital Management. LRT Capital runs a value investment strategy. And Lucas has a very interesting background. With 14, he already started his first business. He then started another one which he sold off here in the US. And after that, he actually started to invest professionally. He now has a seven year track record in his value investment strategy. But what is special about it is that he also has developed a proprietary, unique quantitative component that he runs alongside his qualitative investment style. So on the quantitative side, he is using certain elements, modules, still uh, skills and processes I'm sure we're going to hear more about to actually do portfolio management and risk management. And Luca said that this part is actually responsible for probably 50% of the performance and the alpha of his strategy. So I'm originally from Warsaw, Poland. I grew up in the UK, Hungary, and then many years in the US. When I was in Poland, I started my first business, building websites and e-commerce solutions for clients. Later on, when I moved to the United States, I finished high school in the Midwest, in Columbia, Missouri. And when I was a senior in high school, I got another opportunity to start another company. And we launched a business building software for tracking legislation and campaign finance at the state level. After doing that for about a year, I was a co-founder of the company, so there were other people involved as well. I decided I needed to go to college, and I got the opportunity to go to Seton Hall University in South Orange, New Jersey. And I went there for two years, and I graduated in two years, so I was very fortunate. I graduated in two years from what was normally a four-year degree program. They let me off on good behavior, as I like to say. And I went back to St. Louis, Missouri after that, where my company was based. We sold the company in 2010 to a bigger outfit in DC. I traveled around the world a little bit, and then I applied for an MBA program, and I was accepted at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. And as part of my MBA, I traveled to Hong Kong, where I ended up meeting my future wife there in Hong Kong. And once I finished my MBA in the United States, I moved to Hong Kong in 2012, in the summer there. And in October 2012, I launched an investment strategy seeded with my own money. So Lucas, you obviously started the strategy seven years ago. You have now grown a team. Tell us more about your team. So for many years, I operated as a solo lone wolf operator. But recently, I brought on two employees. We have a fantastic head of research. She's a woman. She has many years of experience. She's a PhD from NYU. And we've collaborated sort of informally for a number of years. And finally, I convinced her to join the team full time. So her job is equity research full time. Uh, that's all she's doing. And I also brought on a head of business development to help me raise assets and market the strategy to investors. And I expect to bring on one or two more analysts in the next 12 months or so. So you have developed what you call the economic mode strategy. How does it work? So I am an active equity investor. So I'm looking to invest in stocks all around the world, but primarily in the United States. And I'm looking for companies with three characteristics. Number one, some kind of durable, sustainable, competitive advantage, a moat, if you will. Second, I need the business to be able to actually grow and reinvest within that moat. And third, I'm looking for a management team that understands capital allocation and how to use capital allocation to maximize shareholder value over time. I'm a long-term investor, and it's my contention that in order to have a successful long-term investment, you need all of those three components to be in place. If you just have a moat, a competitive advantage, but you can't grow and reinvest within it, you're just returning cash to shareholders, you can very quickly end up like a shareholder of Kraft Heinz or General Mills. You're down 50, 60%. As soon as the value of the moat is being questioned. If, on the other hand, you just have growth, but you don't have a moat, you very quickly can end up like 
GoPro, Fitbit, Blue Apron, Crocs, the list goes on and on. So many companies where you have very high profits, competition comes in, crushes profits, and you're down 80, 90%. And if you have growth and you have a moat, but you have a management team at the top that consistently destroys value through bad capital allocation, you can end up like shareholders of Microsoft under Steve Ballmer, where for 14 years you made zero return. You had this wonderful business that grew over time, and then management continuously did bad acquisitions that destroyed value. And the proof of that is that when Steve announced his retirement, the stock went up by $25 billion in one day. That's how much management's capital allocation was suppressing the value of the company. So in summary, you need all three things. You need a moat, a sustainable competitive advantage, you need growth, the ability to grow and reinvest within that moat, and then you need a management team that uses shareholder, the capital allocation to maximize shareholder value. So Lucas, how do you actually determine if there is a moat around the company or if it's a good moat? I spend 70 or even 80% of my time on the first part of our investment process, which is the moat, identifying and understanding the moat, the nature of the competitive advantage that a business has. And to me, this is a term that's very overused and I get angry sometimes because people just use it so freely without really much intellectual rigor. So I want to be very clear about what a moat is. To me, it has to be one of four things clearly identified in a business. If I can't identify these things, I can't understand them, I don't proceed any further with the analysis. So to me, a moat is one of four things. Number one, they can be intangible assets, brands, patents, licenses, government approvals, something that inhibits competitive entry. Secondly, some businesses benefit from network effects. And network effects arise anytime the market share growing makes the product or service more and more valuable to the customer, from the customer's perspective. Third, some companies benefit from high switching costs. Switching costs arise anytime it's risky, expensive, difficult, or time-consuming to change suppliers. And this leads to very long-term customer relations and pricing power for the company question. And finally, fourth, some businesses have processes or scale that leads to sustainable cost advantages. And here, the relative scale of competition matters more than absolute scale. So those are the four things that are true sources of competitive advantage. Intangible assets, network effects, switching costs, and process or scale-based cost advantages. And I want to really quickly say what a moat is not, because I hear these terms used so freely. Being big, simply being a big company, is not a moat. General Motors is a very big company. It doesn't earn good rates of return on capital. Having large market share is also generally not a moat. In the insurance world, State Farm is the largest auto insurer in the United States. It does not earn good rates of return on capital. Other things that are thrown out, like a culture of innovation or great management, whatever that may mean to you, that by itself is not a competitive advantage. Only the first four things that I mentioned are true sources of competitive advantage and that's what I think about probably 70 to 80% of my process. So Lucas, what you're saying all makes great sense. So I wonder how many companies are left, right, that fulfill those three criteria. And tell us more about your research process, please. Mm -hmm. So there is no simple process or funnel methodology that we use to identify investment opportunities. Because any process that can be easily codified and quantified can also be easily replicated through computers and machines. So part of what is our competitive advantage as a business is that our process is focused on qualitative insights about companies. Things that are difficult to arbitrage away or replicate through quantitative means. So there's no screening process for moats that you can find on a Bloomberg, for example. So to find investment ideas, we spend a lot of time analyzing the value chains of different industries. So for example, if you think about the car industry, 
the car starts off as a sheet of metal somewhere. And that sheet of metal had iron ore that was mined and shipped somewhere. And then you have the car maker actually, and there are suppliers to the car maker. Then there's very specialized tooling that goes into the factory. Then there's the car dealers, which in some countries are separate entities from the car maker. Then there's the parts suppliers, the aftermarket parts, servicing the cars, oil changes, etc., insuring the cars. And then eventually the car dies and someone needs to salvage the car, take it off to a salvage yard. So we spend time thinking about that value chain and where the value is most likely to accrue. Places where there's specialization, where there's network effects, where there's barriers to entry are more interesting to invest. And that's where we're spending our time focusing on. There's over 50,000 companies we could potentially invest in, but we're very quick at eliminating ideas because you can very quickly tell if a business may have a moat or may not. So it's somewhat of an idiosyncratic idea generation process, but that leads us to our unique portfolio. So Lucas, you mentioned portfolio. Tell us more. How does your portfolio look like? So we run a concentrated and very long-term focused portfolio. We have between 20 to 25 positions at any given time. Right now we have about 24 and we hold these companies for as long as possible. We're looking for businesses so that can really compound in value over long periods of time. Generally in a given year we'll make two to three position changes. If we make four position changes in a year I'll consider that a very active year. So four position changes out of 24 is very active for us. We generally buy with the intention of holding for many, many years. But the flip side of that is also that we only need about three to four good new investment ideas every year. And the portfolio construction is quite unique and it's different from anything I've seen anyone else do in that we start with a list of businesses that we want to invest in, currently the 24 companies, and we pair that with a position in long-term US treasuries, which we execute through the very liquid TLT ETF. And then we have a very proprietary process that's completely quantitative, it's systematic and it's rule-based for actually allocating the dollars to that portfolio. So the position sizing in the portfolio is a function of our risk management process, not of my short-term bias or how much I like one company versus another. And because U.S. Treasuries tend to be negatively correlated to stocks, our portfolio has much lower volatility than the overall market would. And that's why we apply leverage to the entire portfolio level of 175%. So we are long 175%, and of that, it's about 120% equities and about 55% in the long-term treasury position. But even with that uh, leverage and that kind of allocation, we have a portfolio beta of between 0.7 and 0.8. So that's really where the alpha or the value of the strategy comes through. We have a portfolio strategy that has a 70 to 80% exposure to the market, about half the downside exposure of the overall market, and then historically we generated returns about double the market overall. So I'm curious about your quantitative portfolio allocation model. What parameters go into that? In practice, we are executing our process on a monthly basis and we're rebalancing to new risk targets every month. So every month we have liquidity, so we have new money coming in to our strategy. We allocate that to new positions. The portfolio positions may have traded up and down. So we would trim something that outperformed. We would add a little bit to something that underperformed. And most importantly, the data window that we're using to calculate our correlations that shifts one month by one month. So that changes the target exposures as well. So that's the mechanical process. And I think it's very important to have this separation of the qualitative asset selection and this quantitative systematic rule-based approach to actually ex executing the portfolio. And it's important for two reasons. Number one, it actually helps us maximize our risk return in the portfolio. But secondly, it frees us from the emotional burden of trying to micromanage the positions and the portfolio on a daily basis, where we don't believe we have any edge as humans. We think we have an edge 
understanding the companies and the business models of the businesses we want to invest in, but not necessarily trying to pick a short-term bottom in one day or another. And you really have to be in the shoes of a portfolio manager and understand how mentally draining trying to do that thing is. So we completely take that burden away by having this systematic approach. So Lucas, you have delivered very attractive returns for the last seven years. What's your outlook? What's your take? Can you continue to outperform? Anytime I talk to prospective investors about my strategy, I never focus on performance. What's important to understand is the process that ultimately drives the performance. I believe we have a wonderful investment process that's most importantly predictable, repeatable, and consistently executed. And I believe we have a sustainable investment edge because we are primarily focused on qualitative insights about a business. We're trying to understand why some companies are able to maintain long-term customer relations, why businesses buy from one customer, one company, or another, why they're willing to pay a premium for that business or product. That's what we're after. And we're after also things that are changing in an industry. Those are things that systematically, over long term, determine the returns that companies earn. We're not looking for quantitative edges, things that are easily arbitraged away for quantitative methods. And in today's environment, so many people are running towards the quantitative side of things. AI, machine learning, alternative data sources, flying satellites all over the world, taking pictures of parking lots, counting cars. That is not the game we want to play. We're looking for qualitative insights about businesses, and we see fewer and fewer people actually pursuing that source of edge. And that's what gives me the confidence to say that we have a sustainable strategy over the long term. So we talked before, and I understand you're quite proud of your active risk management process. Tell us more about that, please. Risk management, I believe, is the most important thing that a portfolio manager can do. And it's the most important part of any strategy. We cannot manage returns. We can't force returns to happen. The only thing we can do in the short term is to manage the risks we take. And to that extent, I think there's four unique things that we're doing in our economic mode strategy to minimize the risks. First is the operational risk of the companies we're actually investing in. That's lessened by only investing in companies that have a strong competitive advantage. If it doesn't have a moat, it's not in the portfolio. Second is the macroeconomic risk, just the risk that there's going to be a recession. We can't predict when a recession will happen, and we don't pretend we can. In fact, we think most people can't pr predict when there will be a recession. So we always have to operate with an idea that we will hold companies through the entire economic cycle. But in our strategy, Macroeconomic risk is lessened by only investing in companies that are price setters and not price takers. If you're a business where you have to have a prayer session before raising prices by 1% or 2%, you're not in the portfolio. So the companies we own are much less macroeconomically sensitive than the average company out there. Third is the valuation risk, the risk of overpaying. We never buy stocks on a valuation, on an expectation where we will resell them to someone else at a higher price. We buy at a valuation at which we're comfortable holding companies, potentially indefinitely. Now, I want to be very clear, the valuation of a company depends on its competitive advantage and its growth opportunity. Some businesses are overvalued at 10 times current earnings. If they're declining, they're structurally challenged. There are other companies where they're cheap at 25 times current earnings because they have enormous potential for future growth and reinvestment. And finally, the volatility risk. And that is lessened for our unique quantitative portfolio construction process. The use of long-term treasuries to dampen volatility and the volatility-based kind of portfolio allocation process that we use. So together, those four things help us manage risk and minimize it for our investors over time.